Ed Zeidel, Director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. The Impact of the Computing and Data Revolution on Science and Society. Thank you. Uh, I'm so very pleased to be back here in what I consider my hometown. I lived here for uh, seven years and what I consider the uh, highlight of my scientific career and of, and of my life generally. I really, really enjoyed uh, working and living here. And I would like to tell you today a story about um, not just one, but I would say the two uh, most important revolutions of science in the 20th century and how they're played out by a relationship between two very important institutes, the Konrad Zuse Institute here in Berlin and the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam. So let me start at the beginning, what I, what I would consider the beginning of the, of the rest of the future of our society, which is really focused on, around digital activities. At the beginning here, as uh, 75 years ago, uh, as of 75 years ago tomorrow, I believe it is, that uh, Konrad Zuse invented what uh, was not just a, a digital device, but a, a programmable digital computer. That's the very important part of it, the ability to take uh, a digital device and program it for, for whatever purposes. In fact, and as we'll see, there are many, many uh, activities around digital uh, computing that have revolutionized science, and that's the, really the main part of my talk, but also uh, have, have revolutionized society in many ways. But let me, let me go back, actually, to start this off, to put this in context before the beginning. Before the beginning, we have, uh, at, on Earth, we have life that is merely single cell about a billion years ago moving to multicellular life and at the same time a billion light years away there are two black holes that were colliding and i've shown them here in this video these two black holes were colliding and they've emitted more energy in a burst of gravitational waves and i'll come to this in a minute predicted by einstein uh, about a billion years later um, gravitational waves that would be flying towards the earth at the speed of light uh, and in that few milliseconds that those two black holes collided, more energy was emitted than in all of the stars in the universe combined. So the question, one question here is, why is this relevant? Because those waves are coming towards us and society is going to evolve from single cell organisms to very advanced digital beings that are able to actually develop the technologies and also to develop the, the understanding by applying digital uh, computing techniques to the equations that Einstein gave us to be able to both detect and understand the signals that are coming from those gravitational waves. But it's going to take about a billion years, and so this is part of my story. So about a billion years later, but about 100 years ago, in fact, precisely 100 years ago today, Albert Einstein, after working for 10 years thinking very hard about the nature of space and time. So if someone like Einstein is stumped on a problem for 10 years, it gives you an idea how, how profound this problem must really be. What is the nature of gravity? And he worked out that it's actually uh, a curved space-time that matter, matter meaning any, any sort of uh, objects, the Earth, the Sun, of you and me, we all have gravitational fields around us, we actually distort space and time around us so that time actually slows down. And how can that possibly be? So how could anyone possibly imagine that? But Einstein did. And it also changes the distances and it, ch it curves space and time. So that if I, were to, if I were to throw something into the audience here, basically that object would move as straight as possible in a curved space-time, and it would go up and it would come back down in that, that, in that arc. And so that's, that's what Einstein worked out for us. Now, it turns out he actually gave this uh, theory to us um, just very close here, uh, down very near the, the Brandenburg uh, Gate, uh, where, uh, in, at the Prussian Academy, on the 25th of November, 1915, so almost exactly 100 years ago today. So that changed everything in science and engineering. It changed everything in terms of how we thought of ourselves, how could we, we live in a curved space time and so on. But there is a real problem with Einstein's theory in that the equations that he came up with, and I show them here, the equations are so complicated that even he wasn't able to solve them. He had no ability to solve these equations, nor did generations of talented scientists for hundred years afterwards, almost no ability to solve these equations. He was very, very frustrated by this. 
and he, he uh, actually wrote a, a letter congratulating someone, um, Carl Schwarzschild, who discovered the, the first solution to his equations, of, which are, was later known about a half a century later to be what we call a black hole, that he was able to find any solution at all to his equations. So Einstein was very frustrated by this. And I, so I also point out a picture here of, of Berlin around 1915. And it shows that civilization has advanced quite a lot, but perhaps not yet enough to either understand Einstein's equations nor to actually um, predict or detect the gravitational waves. So let's, let's move a little bit further into the future. So we're now just entering the digital age. And so these gravitational waves are coming towards us at the speed of light, and they're probably about 60 or 70 light years away, and we have not, not much time to figure out what this is all about. And so Einstein developed this, these, he actually predicted there would be gravitational waves in the first year uh, after his theory, so 100 years ago still. Um, but in fact, he wasn't really sure about it. And 20 years later, because these equations were so complicated, he, and he didn't really actually understand many aspects of his theory, and, or nor, nor did anyone, he actually tried to publish a paper 20 years later that said actually, I retract my statement about gravitational waves. I think that was wrong. Now someone, the referee of, of his paper, somehow had the courage to reject a paper from Albert Einstein 20 years after he had discovered the theory of, general theory of relativity. And he was right, and Einstein then retracted his retraction and said, oh, okay, these, I think these are real, but I think no one will ever possibly be able to detect them because they are so weak. So it's just, it's nice that they're in my theory, but I think that there's no way anyone will ever see them. So, on, along comes something actually much simpler than Einstein's theory, just the digital world of zeros and ones. Now, what could be more simple than that? Just zeros and ones. And how could that possibly be more profound than Einstein's theory? And yet, as we see now, because of the invention of the digital computer from Konrad Zuse, we're able to do so many things from solving Einstein's equations to uh, being able to order a taxi from our phone while we're standing on a, the corner, a street corner. And this is because of the digital revolution. So Einstein had a famous uh, statement, which is that things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I would say nothing could be simpler than zeros and ones, and yet the impact of that is more profound, I would say, than, than, than even Einstein's theory itself. So around this time, uh, this is the, the 1940s and 50s, not only did the digital computer that was able to manipulate zeros and ones, digital, digital numbers, um, come along, but um, Heinz Billing, uh, a colleague, uh, actually developed um, technologies for storing data. And this, of course, became a, a major advance. And uh, as we'll hear more from Tony Hay, the ability to store, manipulate, and serve up data has really profound implications, particularly about our ability to share information almost instantaneously across the world and, and the implications that that has. Now, it turns out that Heinz Billing also worked on gravitational wave detectors. And there's a, there's a funny story. If you followed all the news of the last year, you'll, you'll know that gravitational waves were detected. I'll come to this in a minute as well. Uh, just uh, in this last year. And in fact, um, the, the detection was based on some designs that were developed by Heinz Billing. Uh, and it's another example where early developments in science, very important developments, were carried out here first in Germany and then later picked up by others and, and used. And I'll just point out, I had the, the privilege of meeting Heinz Billing once when I was living here in Berlin about 20 years ago. Okay, a little bit further into the future now. So computing is advancing. Uh, and in fact, there's a tradition of computing in Germany that I think is at, at the time that we're talking about the 1970s and 80s that is really second to none. And in particular, Max Planck Institutes, uh, and one in, uh, in the Max Planck Institute for Physics and Astrophysics uh, outside of Munich, um, was leading the way, and they actually bought a Cray 1 computer, one of the first uh, computers. Um, uh, what, what we call supercomputers today. And, and that really revolutionized scientific, not only scientific computing, but the applications. And Larry, it turns out, was working on the problem of what else? Colliding black holes. And so he couldn't solve the equations either. Einstein couldn't solve them. Larry couldn't solve them. He knew he needed to have a, a large computer. The only place he had access to a computer for basic research was not in the United States. It was in Germany. And so he came here in the late 70s and early 80s and began doing his computing here. 
this led him to be very frustrated with the American system, and he came back to the U.S. in the early 80s, and he wrote a, a, a famous proposal, which is actually, I have a picture of it here. This for us is like the Gutenberg Bible. I, it's, in a, it's actually in a, in a glass case in the Spurlock Museum at the University of Illinois, because he said, basically, and I actually have a quote from his, his, uh, his uh, proposal. I, I, I digged into this. This is actually his proposal, and I highlighted some, some things here, and it says, Computational astrophysicists have been going to the Max Planck Institute for Physics in West Germany to do their computing. This is because they have a Cray-1 computer, which I can't get access to anywhere else. So then he goes on to say that Max Planck is a model for what is needed in the United States. And this proposal, which came unsolicited to the National Science Foundation in the US, created not only one, but five national supercomputing centers with Max Planck as a model for, for the way the US could make computing available for scientific advances. And so that led to the founding of Center NCSA, which I am the director of. And we are now celebrating our 30th anniversary this year as well. So there are a lot of anniversaries to celebrate this year. So let me, let me move ahead a little bit further in time. So around 1995, I was recruited in what was one of the, the great fortunes of my life to come to Berlin to help build a brand new institute um, outside of, of Berlin uh, in Potsdam, actually in Golm. Um, it was in Potsdam first, it moved to Golm, um, a little tiny village outside of uh, Potsdam. And uh, it was a, 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 an institute devoted to solving, to studying Einstein's equations, the largest institute in the world devoted to solving or studying Einstein's equations. And the, the equations are so rich that you can have an entire institute with five different Abteilungen that study all aspects of Einstein's theories and applications, gravitational waves, and so on. And so I was privileged to be able to come here to help um, begin that institute in, in 1995, 96 is when I finally moved here to Berlin. And of course, I knew that I needed to have computing in order to solve these equations in the work I was doing. So I turned where else to the Konrad Zuse Institute here in Berlin, and we developed a, a wonderful collaboration that went on for, for a very long time. In fact, there are still um, aspects of it that are continuing today. And the, that matrix of images is, is, is output from that collaboration. A lot of, uh, a lot of magazine covers, uh, for example, this is one which uh, you, you read the title. If you're German here, it says The Hunt for Gravitational Waves. Another one which I think is really, really, really very interesting. This is a visualization that was done of gravitational waves from black holes done jointly by the Albert Einstein Institute and the Conrad Zeus Institute. And it was on the cover of the United States National Science Foundation budget request to Congress in 2006, asking for $8 billion, but highlighting the science with work coming out of Berlin. <laughs> I don't know if anybody actually knows this, but this actually, German science was used to, to motivate $8 billion in funding in the US for basic science. So we did a lot of work in those days, and I was very proud of it. And I'll show you an example of it here. So we, we actually pioneered the techniques of how you would study two black holes colliding by looking at different um, uh, regimes. So when, when two black holes have collided and they form one big black hole, that's what basically what happens. You end up with some part of space time that is oscillating and vibrating. And I don't know if this will play if I, if I click on this or not, but let's see, does that? The movies won't play unless I actually have the mouse on them, but it doesn't really matter. So there were these three regimes. One is the very end after the two black holes have collided. One is the regime when they're just about to collide, the so-called grazing collision. And then the other one is the in-spiral where the black holes are going around each other. So we actually were able to do all aspects of this problem early on, but not quite finish the job to be able to compute real waveforms. We had a sort of a cartoon of what the waveforms would look like if someone were to actually detect this with some detectors which would be built in and actually did uh, detect the waves. But the point is, we, we were able to pioneer this work jointly between the Albert Einstein Institute and the Conrad Zeus Institute. We had a large collaboration. We also developed software environments that allowed people to uh, solve these equations uh, anywhere. So work that Einstein and many others after him were, were unable to do could now be done by any graduate student working in physics anywhere in the world just by downloading this, by sharing the data of the software that were made available. And so we pioneered this together. And by the way, I have that little NSF logo there to point out that actually the NSF did pick this up and now funds this actual um, <laughs> thing called the Einstein Toolkit and supports it for people around the world to use. And so the main point is that there are um, about um, 15 different countries 
that are able to take advantage in this, of this revolution. And being able to solve the Einstein equations for the first time by the application of the digital computer is a major advance, perhaps one of the, the most ad, uh, important advances in computational science because they're the most complex physics in all of, of mathematic, uh, mathematical physics, mo most complicated equations. And uh, the, the point is that they can now be solved by anyone, and, and there are groups around the world that actually participate in this. So this came out of the, the relationship between the Zeus Institute and the AEI in, in Potsdam. So what happened about 10 years later, uh, in fact, just last February, it was announced, and if you were looking at any newspaper, it was on the cover of every newspaper, the New York Times, the BBC had it covered in great detail. Every newspaper, even the Champaign-Urbana News Gazette in, in Illinois had it on their cover about gravitational waves having been discovered, uh, as predicted. And these are the, the black holes that I was talking about from a billion years ago that were far away from us, a billion light years away, collided and sent their waves to us, and we were able to discover them. This is a picture of the big announcement on February the, the 11th. In fact, that's Ray Weiss, as he's known in the US on the left, Kip Thorne on the right. Uh, on the right. Ray is actually from Berlin as well. Uh, but a professor at MIT, and these are likely Nobel laureates in the future. And that's the actual graph from the paper. Notice how it looks very much like what we had in our early days here between the Konrad Zuse Institute and, and the AEI in Berlin. So I've told this one story in some depth, but I'm going to just use that as, as an example. Um, there were many other advantage, uh, advances in science due to the digital revolution, and I won't go into detail, but I'll say there are stories just as rich as this one in every area, and in particular, at the University of Illinois, we have one of the largest supercomputers available in the world, following on the, the inspiration that came out of Max Planck here, and uh, we, it's, a, it's a Cray supercomputer. Later, you'll hear a, a talk from Cray about advances in computing, but here's another example. Um, there's a beautiful painting, which you'll all recognize. Um, it turns Turns out, 100 years before Einstein, Navier and Stokes developed a theory of turbulence of fluids, and in fact, those equations were so complicated that they also cannot be solved easily. And there's a great quote here by a mathematician, a great mathematician, saying, basically, when I, when I die and go to heaven, I would love to learn about turbulence, but I don't think even they will have the answer for me. Uh, but it turns out, now, with advances in computing, within the next decade, we should be able to solve those equations in as much detail as needed for, for example, fluid flow on an airplane, that is, air flowing by, by an airplane wing. Another example, going back to the emergence of, of multicellular life, Klaus Schulten at the University of Illinois is using that large computer to do 500 million atom simulations from first principles of an entire organelle in a cell, a part of a cell that does photosynthesis, and within the next uh, decade, we should be able to simulate entire life forms on a digital computer uh, from first principles, and you'll hear more from Michele Parnello about the, the kinds of techniques used for that. So, just I couldn't stop without saying a few words about data. Data are an even more profound revolution than I would say supercomputing. They're much broader. We, we deal with it every day with our email. And the main point I want to make about data is that, for example, if you're in gravitational wave physics, you can collaborate with your colleagues around the world. In fact, there were 1,005 authors on that famous paper that I told you about. Uh, they came out in, uh, just in February. Um, the only way they could possibly work together was by sharing data across the world. And so the sharing of data is revolutionizing science. And I have many examples. The Large Hadron Collider, which discovered the Higgs boson, 30,000 scientists working together by sharing data, the only way they could possibly do that, new telescopes coming out, and so on. So many examples of this, and I'll just go on to my, my last of slides here and, and point out what's happening uh, as a result of all this on society. So we have the Cray-1 supercomputer as at the Max Planck Institute. The power of that computer is in your hand. In fact, it's more than that. In fact, a, an iPhone 6, I looked this up, has about 1,500 times as much power as a Cray-1, and it has 15,000 times as much memory. Now, what happens if you put that power in your hand? Major changes are happening to society. You have the largest taxi companies, Facebook, you have the largest uh, hotel company, Airbnb, having no facilities whatsoever. They don't own any cars, they don't own any hotels, and yet they are providing services around the sharing of data that are changing society. 
we're able to now sequence human genome that cost a, a billion dollars in, in the year 2000. For $100, you can get your own genome sequence and understand what kinds of traits you might have and so on. And also citizen science. There's a beautiful story here. Uh, a young 10-year-old um, astrophysicist named Kathy Gray discovered a supernova. And she did this by having data available to her from a, of an observatory, the youngest person ever to, to discover a supernova. It turns out her <coughs> brother also discovered a supernova um, and uh, was only nine. So, <laughs> so I'd like to just say thank you very much to everyone here for having me here. I really enjoy being back in Berlin always. And I wanted to celebrate my own collaboration here with some people that I know from the, the Conrad Zeus Institute over the years. Uh, some people we worked with, particularly Christian Haig, I saw that you're here, and, uh, and the people at the AEI. And it really comes back to Conrad Zeus for having inspired us and enabled us to do all of this work. So thank you.